Okay. Um, all right, so this will be a first for me. I've got no notes, no anything. We're doing something artistic, so I figured I'll just be an artist and just, you know. Do it live. Do it, do it live. <laughs> so, um, that memory? <laughs> yeah. Um, so what I said I was going to do was uh, an overview of what, um, sort of my workflow through um, as a as a as a uh, owner of a studio. I guess let me back up. So in another life, I um, I, I actually could have been a professional jazz musician um, in, in New York City. We um, we've, at least when I was around, we had a lot of strong music programs. So I, I've been in like jazz bands and other types of bands since I was in junior high school. What did you play? Guitar, Say again. What did you play? Uh, tennis saxophone. Uh, I was classically trained on tennis saxophone. I played bass a little bit, guitar, and played some flute. Um, but um, <clears throat> it was uh, ended up being mostly a hobby for me. But by the time I got, uh, I came down here for school, and um, uh, as for those of you who've been to engineering school, you know the importance of music and math, the relationship between the two, right? So when I was in Drexel, a lot of us had studios on campus. I mean, like. You walk in, there's keyboards, there's racks of stuff, and you're like, when you study, you're like, oh, I'm in a bunch of engineering. <laughs> okay. And you go to music school, and you know, they, they've got nothing, so interesting. Um, while I was there, there was actually three of us on in, um, one floor of that studio, and I mean, we'd have that place like rocking on weekends. But uh, after college, I, well, okay, when I was at Drugs, I did two co ops with Sony. So while I was there, I got introduced into some of the deeper details of sound production, which is really the mastering side. Um, I was at Sony when Minidisc was being developed, so I actually worked on that, uh, worked on laser optimization, and um, I can give you a whole like, deep dive on that stuff if you're going to just have your head hurt. But what it taught me was really how to do the full thing from soup to nuts. So as a composer, um, wanted to be able to produce my own stuff, as most musicians do, it became, you know, sort of the quest of, okay, well, how do I do this without spending an arm and a leg for the software? And by then, I was deep into Linux. So in, I don't know, 2000, 2001, I started a publishing company, registered with ASCAP. Um, we released two projects. They were up on iTunes and CD Baby. I was getting royalty checks. Um, and, you know, I, it was something I was able to do. And these days, uh, that was like in 2001, these days it's not a big deal for musicians to release their own stuff. It's just nobody does because everybody wants to be associated with a label. Um, this is where it all starts. So what I did was um, I wanted to pull in some things just to give you an idea of what, what is possible. So the first thing is, <laughs> The first thing is, you need a large screen. <laughs> um, my studios, I, I work on two monitors, but the thing that brought me to that was the studio setup. It, it's, pick a monitor and it's, it's never big enough. This, this is bad resolution, but even on like a 1080p um, size monitor, it gets really tight. Um, I'm not even, actually, I might even be able to show you the other software that this is actually better than this stuff, but these things are so congested right now. If you want my laser pointer, but I don't know if you guys can see <coughs> the stuff on here, but if you've ever seen a studio console and it's made your eyes hurt, just looking at these what you call the channel strips, and they'll be like a mile long sometimes. You see guys in the studio going like this, right? Or they'll use a, uh, they'll use like a little, um, like in the casinos, you know, they pull the craps table. They'll use a thing like that sometimes. Um, well, these, these channel strips can get very, very long, and thankfully in software we can usually resize things, but I don't think I can resize this one anymore. And which, which studio is this? This is Muse. Um, I'm going to talk about this in a second. Um, yeah, you see, it, it starts to get, it just won't work at a certain point. We've got a little bit of play, but not much. This is called um, Muse. It's actually the one thing that does not come with Ubuntu Studio. So what I'm running here is Ubuntu Studio 17.04. Uh, they do have an LTS version, but I just grabbed the, the newest one, and it, it, it works. 
out the box. Um, yeah. Does um uh does Muse or Ubuntu um part of my ignorance uh, map well to control services surfaces? Yes. Yes. Um, I'm old school, so I have outboard gear and I've got the computer. So they kind of you can mix and match. My you know hardware console will feed the audio inputs um, that this gets connected to a USB interface, and then the outboard studio, the guitar, the mic for the, the saxophone, uh, the mics for vocalists, all that stuff gets plugged into a mixer, and then that mixer's got an audio output output over USB that goes back to the computer. And then you'll see when we get into Jack, you turn on the interfaces you want. Now, some interfaces are better than others. Some only do one channel, some will do multi-channel, right? So if you have to track, you know, if you're, if you're if you're going to track like a choir singing, that user is going to need three mics. So you want to record all three at the same time. So it, it depends. It's do you need these buttons and levels the uh, MIDI map? Yes. Yeah. Well, yeah. They have. So these days they'll have the the dumb devices that are just controllers. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, usually, so for traditional position, when I see when you say controller to me, I'm thinking of a keyboard that's dumb, and I've got a stack of modules here. Okay. Um, you'll see that more in the studio than, you know, if you're live, you'll, you'll stack keyboards, right? In the studio, you'll stack models because those are all your sound sources. For the musician in a box, they call it, um, it's your laptop. Your laptop has all your sounds on it, and then you'll have your keyboard, which is dumb. You might have a, a pad surface that's dumb, and you might have a mixer that's also dumb. So you can use all that outboard stuff to control the software. Um, I don't have much, but like I said, I don't have much experience with that because I, I don't necessarily do that. Uh, but all that is available. Okay, thanks. Um, so what I have here, just to give you an example of something, I, I actually, when I started doing more software-based um, production, I use Muse, and the reason why is that Muse can integrate audio and MIDI. Okay, so that's probably the most important things about production when you start doing things in the computer. You want MIDI because you want to be able to switch instruments and change up your, your sound. You want audio because you, you can't plug you know, a MIDI jack into a signal. You know, sometimes you want to shove it down your throat and <laughs> split it up. Um, so you need to do both. And you also have to need, you, and you also have to have all this stuff synced together. And that's where jack comes in. But as far as the thing that you'll be using as the, um, sound engineer, and that's really in this role that I'm talking about today, because I can't explain like really sound engineering production and sort of not composition here, but basically I'm talking about the tools that a sound engineer would use, okay? So this is like, you know, if I was doing a, a, a college course, this would be like one-on-one, -on -one, okay? It would get you to that point of being able to use these tools. So the first thing is you want something that will integrate audio and MIDI. Uh, you'll see here it says add drum track. It's just a certain, it's a type of MIDI track, basically. Um, you also, for uh, more advanced things, you want something that will also do sense because you need those four effects. And I'm going to demonstrate that as well. Um, since this, this would be a sound source, okay? So remember I say you have your sounds on the computer? So I guess it's pronounced Desi. That's something I've never heard of, but Desi, uh, I think that's the Cakewalk standard. It's one of the commercial programs out there. It's a sound standard. So you can go online, you can buy CDs of sounds, and they're in a certain format. You can load them in here, and I'm not sure if there's any in here, but let's, let's see. Oh, there are. Okay. So Fluid Synth is, a, is another. Um, it's technically an audio plugin, but it's a synth module that you load sounds into. So what happens is that you fire that up, you load a sound, and you connect it to Jack, and then you take, you can route the outputs of that synth into your software. In this case, you use. Um, I know I'm throwing a lot at you. <laughs> there is, there is, there is a lot to this. Yeah. Keith, can this be, is this like a, like I do guitar as a hobby and mm -hmm. some of my friends of mine have a Pro Tools 
Yep. Then it's not so expensive that I'm not yes. dropping that kind of money for a hobby. Can no. some, is this like a DAC that would? I will show you something that will blow your. If you like Pro Tools, and Pro Tools is what Sony uses in the studio to master stuff. When you see a door, which is why I want to make sure I show that, you're you're, you're just gonna you're gonna walk out here and download this. It's it is that, and actually people write a door or in PA. They're um, West. They're somewhere off of City Line Avenue. I can't even really think of that, that area. Is, but they're they're not too far outside of Center City. Um, it's it's as far as sound stuff is, is as far as this type of work is concerned. A door is the most relevant piece of software out there. It's it's beautiful. It works. It's you'll you'll see. It's is it open fun. source? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You can download it. It, it comes with new news. I have to download news. Uh, so. Again, live CD, that's why I can plug into the network, app get news, done. A door comes with Ubuntu Studio. And this is a door five. Uh, on the LTS version, it's got a door four, so they're they're keeping they're keeping pace. Um, do, you like, do you like Reaper? Do you like Reaper? Never used it. Never used it. Similar. Um, have you ever used uh, have you ever used um, I think I think it's called Lives, L I V E S. Yes. Okay. Lives is lives. L I li lives, I lives. I've heard it's it's described as more similar to uh, Fruity Loops or FL Studio. Yeah, yeah. And lives may even be lighter. Um, if you go to, I guess, go to it here. So, oh, that was the other thing. So, Ubuntu Studio is not just for audio production. It's for video production as well as right. graphic stuff. So, if you know artists that are, you know, they don't want to spend money on. Thank you. <laughs> the, the, the one app that every graphic designer in the planet will say, well, it's not Photoshop, I'm not switching words. Yeah. And then you gotta go, yeah, Photoshop's kind of nice though. Right? Just like Pro Tools, really, really nice. Really, really expensive. Mm -hmm. um, whatever, pay the money or don't, and use some open source stuff. But this does everything. So, the, so, so if you know artists and they're the struggling artists, you know, say, hey, have you ever checked out Ubuntu Studio? There's, there's a lot of, this is much more complete than, I think the last time I looked at it was maybe 10 years ago, and it was good, but it, it, was, it, was, it was more disjoint, you know, things, it just didn't have the slickness to it. This is working really slick. I mean, you think about what I'm doing here, I booted off a live CD, and I'm about to start doing stuff, and you'll see that, okay, this thing is working. There's no optimization here. Got, for those of you who know, you know I like to compile stuff. And studio stuff, I absolutely would compile because I want the tightest coupling to my process possible because latency, as you see, is, is, is important. Um, but um, this, that's one I wanted to mention about Ubuntu Studio. students, not just for the music stuff. Um, and we're, about, uh, we're asking about lives, right? So lives is actually not a right. LML, LMMS is. That's what I meant. That's, that's what I meant. Okay, yeah. So that's, that's what I meant. Like um, that's like a drum machine sort of uh, sort of thing. And, um, that's actually pretty popular. All right. So what do I have up here? Um, you guys familiar with Adult Swim? Mm -hmm. Awesome. This does not need much explanation. <laughs> Oops. I don't know where my sneakers are. Probably underneath. I don't know if that's coming through or not. Just get them feedback. That actually is not the um, system, that is the software. So you've probably heard that before. It's a um, what's called a bump from Adult Swim. And I was hoping that it would come out a little better with the mic, but it wasn't. Um, what I really wanted to point out here, actually, uh, you can kind of hear it going, but I just wanted to point out what's happening. That audio track is being displayed here. This is the input. This is one of the send, this is an effect set, we'll get that in a second. This is the output to the speakers. What you're looking at here 
is the jack controller, which is sort of the master bus that everything's connected into. And then above that, this is the actual control strip for Muse. So what you're seeing is, <coughs> I don't know, you see this line moving here? Okay, so that's the, that's the um, this thing is called, a, it's usually referred to as a piano scroll. Um, it's, it's, um, it's your, it's, um, basically your track display, but that line is your follower, okay? So that tells you where you are in the track or MIDI. You see like MIDI points on there. You can also, it's not going to open up. I can put this over here. You can also get details on it. And that's your, and that's your waveform. Are you running this over and over? Is that why one's at 12 and one's at 30? Yeah. Yes. So, so you got so, Exactly. And that's the next thing I was going to point out. So what you're hearing, which you're probably not hearing, is that this thing is looped. But when it loops, it's not stuttering. Okay? You're not hearing, we'll just see if you can hear it. Okay? You just heard snap back because it's different, but it, it, it didn't sound out of sync. It didn't sound out of time, right? right. The reason for that is because. Is that a side the proper? <clears throat> the reason for that is because if you look over here at Jack, You'll see that blinking right there, RT. Anyone want to take a guess what that stands for? Exactly. So we all know, well, you guys know that the Linux kernel can be forced into a real-time mode, right? Yeah. OK. So the key to audio production, and, and really anything that you care about, let's call it frame accuracy. And I'm, I'm being vague on purpose, but if, without getting into the math, this is, is fine. okay, so that says 44, 100 hertz. Anyone know what that is? Sample of? Sample of? Of? Uh, the, if you're taking a sample of the volume at 44,000 times a second, mm -hmm. it's probably a 16 bit depth. Uh, but it's not it's, yes, it, it is. It's uh, well, actually, maybe thirty-two, but but the sample rate, you know, it comes from. That's the CD rate. Yeah. Yes, that's the what's called the red book. Right. That's why I guess it would be sixteen bit because I, it, it, is it, you're mm -hmm. doing uh, higher end audio. You're going to be at ninety-six twenty-four or better. You can you can so when you get into sound production, would you realize that you can do anything you want? So you can run and when. George has Audacity, you'll see you got you can it'll show it at the bottom on Audacity, but um, yes, it's 44.1 is the original Redbook CD rate, and it wasn't and it was 16 bit. Um, what'll happen in music production is that it'll generally default to 44.1, 44 um, sometimes 16, sometimes 32. I think most of the time it's 16, but you can force it to higher resolutions. Does it make sense? Not really. When you go to 48K sampling, which is more typical, or 96K, which, anyone know why we use 96K sampling? Or where that number comes from? Twice 48. <laughs> it's twice 48, but I have to ask you why, why we got 48. Nyquist rate. Sure. They're all Nyquist rates. Yeah. yeah but but 44.1 is the Nyquist, is the original Nyquist rate, why? Because it's a you little bit above just twice the, with the yeah. map of the highest frequency that you and your thing yeah. So, and the Nyquist rate says what? It's be at minimum 2x oversampling in order to get right. proper mm -hmm. production. Or you flip around the other way, which is if you if you are running something at 44.1, that means the highest frequency it can reproduce is 22.05. Yeah. What's the maximum hearing of humans? They say 20. 20, right? So we did about 2K over that, mm -hmm. right? Okay. Well, that's awesome. So why do we do 48 or 96? A little extra room. Because? Kids can hear better than people. True, but no. We <laughs> <laughs> can and will use that. Dogs can hear better too. My wife can hear better too. I was saying, they can record dog whistles. No. No, it's actually, it's actually simpler than that. Different channels. Left and right channels. Well, it's very, very close. Yes. yes. At 96K, 
We use that because you can <coughs> stuff more channels of lower rates in 96K. Not actually how it's done, but that's how the math was worked out. But 96 came after 48. The reason why we did 48 is because what we realized is that, you, you remember early CDs? Mm -hmm. What was the problem? Garbage. Because? Well, the same The nitrous, no, we, we, no, that's math. We've known about the nitrous rate, rate for a long time. But why did they sound like garbage? Even though it's, it was human hearing, right? Harmonics. Um, you, you missed the, the, the higher infill frequencies. Right, so, well, in our yeah. radio license, we know about harmonics, right? You, this is when harmonics are good, right? Mm -hmm. When you have music, all those waves mix and merge and do all kinds of things, and what happens is that you generate harmonics. Well, 44.1 picked up all of the human hearing stuff, but even though you can't hear some of those, you get to maybe fifth and seventh order harmonics. Okay, so on the top end, you can't hear your harmonics, but what about all the stuff in the middle, right? All those harmonics, weren't getting sampled properly because all of that energy was, if you think about it, so energy is, if you have this amount, right? It's this like, is, it's, what is it? it's like kind of like, was, there's like pressure wave, uh, was it like the geofence? It's like rough, it's one that actually what we realized another, I can't remember. It, it, what we found out is that mm -hmm. we're missing, we, well it's two things. <laughs> one, we wanted a little bit more resolution. So 48K is usually done at about 20, Four bit resolution, typically. Yeah. Right? And so, and so is 96K sample. So you've got your sample frequency, but you also have your bit rate, which is your resolution. Mm -hmm. So what we realized is that we were missing a lot of things. So, for instance, while I was at Sony Mini Disc, what we realized is that, yeah, it sounds okay, but we're using all this trickery to get to get it to sound good, and it, it didn't necessarily sound that good. So. We sort of, as time went on, we sort of got back to basics. And we said, well, if we source things at 48K and higher and use more, uh, and use a higher resolution, so not 16-bit, but go to 24-bit or, or higher if, if you want, and then, and then in your final finalization of it, okay, right before you master, well, if you take something that's high quality and go to low quality, that's going to sound better than if you take something that's let's say average quality, and go to low quality or, or average quality. So even though the math says, yeah, we should go to hear everything, what we realize is that it, it just wasn't working. Well, People could hear a difference. The compression algorithms, because the compression algorithms will actually take a lot of those harmonics and try to turn around and reconstruct it. it so that's what M MP3s use and other things use psychoacoustics to try to fix this. But as we all know, right, here's the old classic argument, right? You know, fast and furious. You want power? Right? Or you want the little fast car, right? It's 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 you have to balance it. You can go raw power and, and everything that raw power needs, or you can do things with a little bit more finesse, but you're you're gonna miss something. Okay? So you have one question? I was just gonna say one other thing that in, when you're doing all of the signal processing, if you do it at a higher sampling rate, you don't have artifacts yep. of your processing. Yep, and that, and that was the other thing. You you will, you, you definitely get more artifacts at 44 to 1, but as you see now, and again, it's hard to do it in this in this sort of setup, most of the time, I'll, when I'm starting out, I'll do things at 44 to 1. If for no other reason, then that's the fault, and I just want to start right. Um, if I'm actually doing something serious, I'm going to do 48. Um, George mentioned effects, and I want to move along, so let's talk about effects. Wait, wait, um, wait. What's, what, could you give me an example of one of those artifacts that you're talking about? A sound artifact. It's, it come, it'll come across as noise. It's, it's easier to explain in, in terms of visually. If you sample a picture in the pixels and then rotate a line, it will look like a staircase. It's sharp. It sounds sharp. Okay, okay. I got you. It's a matter problem. of fact, um, right. so if you look at this waveform, <laughs> yeah. So if you're if you're not interpolating, if you're not interpolating, yeah, you, you, you get a rough line. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I got you. If you think of this this waveform, it doesn't look smooth, but it actually is. It's actually look you're actually looking at the samples, okay? But the samples put together and run this way, they're gonna look like a, it's gonna look like a waveform because it's just it's displaying it in an analog fashion. If I were to dither this to say eight bit, it would it would look like blocks, 
Okay, and that's in a sense an artifact. That's one sort of type of artifact. It's actually this is is one of these things where you'll pick it up with your ear long before I could ever explain it and make right. it make sense. Right, right. You know, as a matter of fact, you would hear it and I can show it to you and you'll go, I get it. Yeah. Um, all right, so I mentioned effects. One of the other things you need here, I and mean, the reason why this is sounding muddled before is because I have all the effects turned on. So there's, before we do that, there's two types of effects. Insert effects and um, loop effects, or send, send effects. And what that means is you either put the effect in between your source and your output, or you send the source to the effect and, and those both go to the output. So what I have here on this track, which is the actual sound, is this wah-wah effect, which it's, it's supposed to be a guitar wah-wah, but it doesn't sound like it. And that's because the parameters are, are just, uh, for what I have, they're just, they're just not working. And like I said, I don't want to get into why that might be the case. I just want you guys to, to hear it for now. Uh, let's go back. So now I've turned this on. And if we go to here, it's not coming through. <laughs> So I'm going to play this a little bit. You hear the difference? Yeah. Higher pitch, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So when I turned up the mix, what it's doing is it's putting more of the effect into the sound and less of the actual source. Okay. Uh, another thing that worked pretty well. Yeah, that would be really good. Right. Yeah. Can you add layers of multiple tracks into this too, then? I, I could. It, it, I don't care about yeah. the demonstration. I just yeah. ask. No, yeah. that's what it's for. That's, okay. yeah. You just you right click and you add the type okay. of track that you want. So you just you just keep going. Okay. Um, I added a send track here just so you could hear the, uh, the effect. Um, so that's one type of effect we've got. Let me bypass this and we'll turn on the turn it off from here. And you'll also see there's like numerous ways to, to turn things on and off. This one is a reverb effect. That sounds horrible right now and that's because it's saturated. So let's make this up. Yeah. Microphone sucks. It's really hard. It's really hard here. I promise you. Just get a new Bluetooth speaker. Okay, so <laughs> we'll, we'll get to that in a second. So you can you probably hear that it became less distorted as I start sliding things around. All right, so you see that's working. It's um. As a matter of fact, you have this sound. My voice sounds right now. It's a reverb effect. This is all. You know? If I were to look down here, you see all these types of effects. So let's put it on the wall. And if we turn up the wet level, which is the effect sound, let's turn down the dry. Coming out a little bit, it's a little distorted, but you get a bit of an echo. Yeah. That's a whole effect, okay? And that what's it's a reverb effect in a, in a large hall. And you would expect it to sound exactly the way my voice sounds right now. Um, okay, so Will. Genius that he is. Mm -hmm. Asking why not use something that would actually work for this audio demonstration. <laughs> very, very simple answer. You forgot? No. <laughs> when you were when you were doing music production, the type of interface matters. So, Bluetooth. This is a wireless thing, right? Wireless is not reliable. I understand that. So if I wanted to use a Bluetooth device for this and try to get the latency reliably down to that, not going to work. Even with a pass-through or some kind of an analog cable? Not going to work. It's physics. You cannot reliably, and especially with wireless signals bouncing all over the place, you can't reliably say, I'm going to receive this amount of data exactly 
in this amount of time. So that's why you're not going to use wireless devices and other things that would incur high latency from using production. In fact, one of my your demo would have been helpful to have a small portable speaker with it. Oh, no, 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 no. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That is still true. That, that is still true. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, like, here you are talking about sound rates and that kind of stuff as an audiophile and using laptop speakers. And as a backup, I actually recorded a video in case this went horribly wrong. But that's okay. It didn't okay. work for me, right? Yeah, if, if I had, uh, and I think my Bluetooth speaker might actually have an audio in, so if I do this in North and West, I'll be sure to bring that. Um, but what you'll see here is, uh, and this is actually much simpler than what it used to be. It, it used to look like that in terms of your, your setup for it. And if you even know what all these settings are, this is a pain in the neck to set up all the time, even though you can save the presets or whatever. You, you don't need all this information. You, you really just need this. I need to know my interface, you'll choose it there, my sampling rate, your frames and periods. Th this is, those two numbers derive your latency. For music production, you generally want to be under 10 milliseconds if you want things to be what's called sample accurate. What's the frame? What's the period? Oof. Oh, God. Okay. Um, Okay, so yeah, it's 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 not. I, I don't want to say it's not worth explaining. It's it's, okay. it's important from from just the artistic point of view. You're going to play around whatever those numbers are. You're going to you're going to play around with them and try to keep your latency under 10 milliseconds. Um, a, 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 if if this is a frame, the period per buffer just these in a chain. Okay, mm -hmm. so I can have long frames, and if I want two of them, and do one, two, and they're very long. Let's say it's 10 milliseconds. Okay, great. I can also do four of those, right? Isn't that like a sample? Sum. It's like a, like a bunch of samples to find? It's, it's roughly how much sample data the system can process at a time. So depending on your hardware, different combinations are going to work better. Um, my computer at home, I, I can get it down to 2.9 milliseconds. This laptop, I can, I've got it to 8. What will tell you what's good or not is you know, what works or not is right here. Now, amazingly, I haven't had any edge runs, which is a fancy way of saying a buffer overflow. Um, George Latin is familiar with this. Yes, is, is the concept of um, uh, frames and, and what we go on? Periods. Uh, periods. Is that similar to uh, an Ethernet type of uh, frame? I, no, but my, my, brain, my brain sort of goes that way. Think about it as a, almost like a, 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 maybe a better analogy might be just a film strip. Like if you look at a frame, yeah, yeah. you know, okay. it right. might be a better analogy. All right, fine. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, you see this X run here? If you get a lot of those, what will happen is that this area here will turn red. Meaning that your system can't keep up. Okay, and you're going to start dropping things. What's going to happen is that if you're recording something, your audio is just going to drop a bunch of data on the floor. It's going to sound like a, going to sound like a bunch of noise. Um, Muse is a pretty lightweight program when it comes to that. So I'm, I'm pushing, well, I was able to do 8 milliseconds, and this time I'm not getting any extra. I actually did get them at home. But I did get them when I was doing a door. So what I'm going to do, actually, I'm actually going to cancel it. Somehow get this window to fit. Yeah. Okay. So as they say, this is the big way. Uh, door. How do we bring all these channels in? So a, uh, a mixer and a USB? Um, you, can, you can actually use Audacity to do your recording to create your waveforms and then you can load it into your track program. Or, 
shield fall from Rodassi that comes into here that lets you mix it? Yes. Um, I'm not sure what I did just now, but it should be All right, so. All right, I'm not sure why I did that, but thankfully it doesn't matter. Um, so this is a door, and it won't even let me trick it down anymore, so. But I won't say the problem, but a lot of these apps sort of expect a certain screen size. But this program is, when you start to dig into this, and I, I don't know, I'm not sure if it's coming across more visually appealing, but to, to me it is. Um, let me just, I'll even show you the, uh, see. all right, so that's the, that's the mix of doing this one. I use a, a darker thing. Um, what would probably be helpful is if we had some oil going on, so you can see how this moves. So, if you notice on here, oh, that's a lot better. It's just smoother, right? Forgot the music, the music's smoother too, but it's it had nothing to do with that. Just look at the build up, and I, and I love this stuff. Um, if you just look how the meters are moving, okay? This is this is how I expect. This is how my board at home works. Okay. Um, over here, it also has the same uh, effect that I had the other one with the reverb. So the nice thing about Linux is when you're using these effects, this window that pops up for the parameters, all the same thing. So if you know how to use the effects in one app. You know how to use the effects in any of the apps, okay? Um, just to show you, like right now, this is on bypass, so we can take it off. Is that a hall effect I was trying to do before? You can actually hear it this time, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So this is how they're making their music. What's that? This is how they're making their music. They make the sound there in the hallway. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Because if you if you if you think about it, if you've ever been to, and we were, and we were all young once, if you've ever been to a, a house party or, or whatever, or a party at your gym, right? When you're walking up to when you're walking up to a concert, right, you hear it. But it has this weird echoing thing, right? Well that's because what you're hearing is all the sound reflections in the in the whatever enclosure that you have. Okay? So you're just hearing some of that sound when you leak out. So the way you emulate that musically, okay, and this is as much sound engineering as we do today, um, is you turn down your dry level, which is your unaffected sound, and you turn up your wet level. So that means you're not getting any direct sound. The way I did it here is that reverb is normally a insert effect. Because I inserted it into the output channel, I forced it to be an insert effect. So in that so in this case, I just have to back off the dry effect a little bit. And actually, they're about they're about even, and it's still that this just happens to be a pretty good effect. It just happened to work. But you can you know it's a little bit easier to hear the difference on this with this particular um, uh, com uh, composition. And the parameters just fit, so you'd have to play around things. You get to do the same thing with the other um, with the other. Um, track that I had, but really what I want to show here is just how much smoother and more refined um, a door is. I mean, every, everything just is, it just works much smoother, and it's got a lot more hands. It also has um, more options and more control over what you can do in terms of the granularity for the uh, audio production. Um, a door also, at this point, does MIDI, and that's the reason I didn't use it in the beginning. Um, not for not for um, MIDI. I could use it for for mastering. So I do all the music, and then the way Jack would work. Actually, one of the last thing I'll show. Um, where is it, Jack? Uh, this this is actually important. So what you see here, this is really the magic of um, Jack. 
all of this stuff here you can control in terms of what goes to what. I'm not going to expand the door because it just gets muddy because it's got so many uh, inputs. But you're able to route your, your readable clients and your routable clients. So think of your read as a source, think of your write is where the sound is going. Okay. The way, I, the way I would do this is I do all my composition in Muse, and then the output of Muse will go to actually something called Jamming, which is a, um, it, it's an effect that's best used for, for mastering. Um, I'm not going to pull it up, but it, um, it's got a lot of the tools that someone who's mastering would use. Then I would take the output of that and go to a door to just record the two-track master. And then in a door, I would sequence the stereo tracks, one here, one here, one here, one here, okay? And you cross fade between them, you could, you know, if someone was gonna do any other interludes, if you're gonna overlay an interlude and cross fade with that, I would track all that out, and then the door would have the master image, and that would get burned to, to CD or DVD. You've got a right mic and a left mic. Mm -hmm. Front, I go to front left, front right, and one of them also goes to a door. Yes. So you'll see, you talking about right here? Talking about the, yep, right there. Yeah. You so, got, yeah, that's going, so that's going yeah. off of uh, the now, pulse. Now, the first one, the bottom two, I want to capture one, capture two, right? Yes. This one's the left and one's the right. Yep. Whoops. You talk, oh yeah, they go, right, because the, when you, when you launch, um, an application that's jack aware, it just grabs whatever the capture interface is, the system capture and the system output. It just grabs it because you've already set that up in your device. What device? Your input, your mixer input? Yes, so when we set up the when we set up the device here, this device, if you look at advanced, you'll see over here. Uh, that, that device is not your sound card, is it? That is, that's In this case, it's a sound button. Yeah, yeah, but it, whatever you sound like. But if you bought like a Burns or Box, an 8 channel thing. You would, you would use that. When you plug it in, it would show up and you'd point it to that. Would you need their software or do you use this stuff? See, Behringer? Uh, depends on what it supports. Um, some things work, some things don't. Mm -hmm. M-Audio stuff will work. I meant to bring my M-Audio transport. That, that just had a good link support with the special driver. Uh, other things are USB compliant and it'll just work as USB audio devices as an actual spec. Um, Behringer's, maybe, you know, certain, you know, certain device, it's, it's typical open source versus closed source stuff again, you know. Um, but it's, it's much better now, that, that's all I can say. We, we need time yeah, we need for audacity. Yeah. My camera is about to die, apparently. <laughs> Do you have a presentation or you just I actually have some tracks. That's what you want to pull off Yeah, one minute. <laughs> it burned a little bit well, faster than I should have. Uh, Will, you had a question? Yeah, I completely forgot. Don't worry about it. Okay. okay. Uh, yeah, sure. this, this was mostly a, a dry run to see whether I could do this kind of thing at all. <laughs> okay, I mean, so I've got like you know five bullet points and a sound. Okay, cool. <laughs> so George is gonna set up, and I forgot. Off down in, in a Jupyter notebook, and I realized that these screen captures were such a pain in the. We know. So this this whole part of the thing is not a great success. I I'll just give the pitch, which is my handful of talking points. Audacity is a free and open source cross-platform audio software to do multi-track recording and editing. In analog terms, it's like a tape recorder. You, you, it, it can take the inputs either from the audio jack or from, you know, not, nothing near as complicated as a, as a jack, but you can, you can also take input from a sound card, which is what I want to eventually do. But right now I'm just 
taking inputs from the audio in and outputs the audio out. And it brings up a much simpler thing than uh, the R do, which is just basically it displays your waveform as you record it. And it presents you, it's got a lot more it can do, but it, what I use it for basically as a, as a tape recorder. I'm capturing my old analog uh, tapes, reel-to-reel -reel tapes and vinyl records and importing and digitizing them. And so it presents this interface where it shows the waveform and then it's got the virtual tape deck controls uh, record, start, stop, play. And uh, what's, I forgot what it's called. Where you monitor? Is that it? Do you have, well, if you look online and you have it, if they're at the top there and you have these other ones, you can just match it up with what you have. Oh, Oh, monitoring. Yeah, it's called monitoring. You just, that's like where you stick your little head headphone into your system as you're recording. So I, I'll go back to my talking point. So, and it does the multi-track thing, which I am not really doing. I'm just recording two, what you know, two mono tracks, which is one stereo track. And the editing, it, I'm again only using the simplest things. What in the old days we do by taking a tape and putting it in this block and cu cutting and pasting. So that's all I'm doing is I, I record a big blob, like an entire album side or an entire reel of tape. And then the editor allows me to cut that up into actual, uh, tracks, or songs, or whatever you want to call them. Then you can do things within that. You can adjust levels. Again, some of the old stereo volume uh, equalizer, which is m more channels than just bass and treble, and volume. Oh, and balance. If Due to the artifacts, if you set up one channel as loud as the other, you can balance it. So I, I'm actually not using, I'm only using about half of what Audacity can actually do. It does have some of these things that the fancier software does, like mixing, cross fading, multi, multi you can do later lay down multiple tracks and then combine them. And there's, you can do some simple things like fading in and out. And you can so show them the effects if you want to, under effects there. That's actually beyond my <laughs> idea. <laughs> 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 set them up. <laughs> uh, okay, I'll get, I'll get back to the blurbs. I mean, basically what I've just been using for this is a, is a digital tape recorder as in digital tape editor to take you know sound in from the analog world and put it into the digital domain. The other general blurb is it's cross-platform, so it's available for pretty much I guess any flavor of GNU Linux, uh, OS X or 10 or whatever. BSD. <laughs> Solaris too. <laughs> you can get a toggle of the source and comp compile it into whatever system you're actually using. Uh, it uses the Wix widgets toolkit so that it's very, very simple to run on it under these different Windows systems. Uh, okay, the last, last thing. I should mention is it, it, the 
proprietary audio format. In it's equivalent to GIF in the image world. So you so it uses WAV, right? It just uses WAV. Yeah, and, and FLAC. And <coughs> Right, yeah. AIF, yeah, it uses AIF, I believe, for for sa for saving temp files. You can get a, an additional library called FFmpeg, which is actually really nice. You can compile it on any system, and what that does will take these various formats, and you can either implement it as library calls if you're writing like C or C++, you know, link it in. Or it's available as filters, so you can just, you know, convert in the command line, convert from AIFF to FLAC to MP3s or whatever. Yeah, that, and the only difficulty I had actually was setting this up was that the, the FFmpeg didn't quite line up automatically with the install of Oh yeah, and then on the output end, what I was able to do in the past was, you know, then assemble these pieces and put the right amount of silence in between to actually create, stitch together a bunch of AIFS into an ISO image, which depending on how locked up your system was by Sony, you could just more or less use DD to write to a to burn a CD which we play on a Walkman or on a disc or whatever. That's how I originally got into this. I'm mean, mostly in the analog world still, but I wanted to be able to rip CDs for my friends to hear. Anyway. Yeah, I had I had one one use for it that I that, that I'm still using, and that is. Um, I have a, 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 a bought a CD that, that recorded nothing but ocean waves, mm -hmm. but I can sleep better with lower frequency. Yeah. So I got all the high frequency waves off of, to a certain point. So I have all real low frequency ocean waves, and it just plays over like 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 an hour and a half of ocean waves, yeah. and then it loops. Cool. Uh, so uh, and I, I still use that thing. And I, 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 I I clipped that off about like, two years ago. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, I, I've used Audacity for a long time. Uh, I will I will tell you if you're copying records and you have to deal with some that are kind of a little worn and scratched and whatever, that the Audacity ha Audacity has a filter you can process the, the whole thing and you can adjust the width and and fine tune so you're not taking too much of the high frequencies out, but you're just picking out the yeah. clicks and pops yeah. and it's amazing. Yeah. Really does it. Yeah. I'm just I'm just curious, what what plugin were you using? Do you remember? Um Thank you for uh, not throwing eggs. <laughs> <laughs> 